Good evening, I am Xavier Salomon, the Peter J. Sharp Chief Curator at the Frick Collection, and welcome to this episode of Frick 5. It's a great pleasure to be here this evening with Emma Capon, who was a curatorial fellow, a Poulet curatorial fellow at the Frick uh, between 2016, 2018, and she curated the fantastic exhibition Charterhouse of Bruges around a Van Eyck painting. Emma is currently in London, where she is the Associate Curator of Renaissance Paintings at the National Gallery. Welcome, Emma. So nice to see you. Hi, Xavier. Thanks for having me. Very nice to see you, too. It's great. So um, let's just dive into the questions. Um, so we start from the beginning. And what is the great work of art or the great uh, monument that first inspired you and inspired you the most? Um, the, it will be the Villeneuve Les Avignons Pieta by Enguerrand Carton, uh, which I encountered at the Louvre when I was just about to take the decision to uh, really pursue art history at um, a graduate degree. Uh, and I didn't know where quite I wanted to specialize myself, so I would go to the Louvre quite often and roam the rooms. And this painting I had seen, I think, um, the size of a postage stamp uh, in reflections. And I entered that room in the early French uh, galleries of the Louvre and saw it, and it was, you know, one of these wow moments. It, it, my, it took my breath away. And I think it's, it's worth explaining how big this is, it's a monumental object, and how vivid it is, you know, the, 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 the contrast between the colors uh, that are very, very darkened and, and this really shimmering, uh, you know, um, gold background. And uh, so the painting, you know, it doesn't really fit into any neat ca stylistic categories. And it was made, that's because it was made in Avignon in the 15th century by a painter who came from the Northern Europe and who basically encountered the Southern tradition and the Southern light. And it's, uh, yeah, it just took my, it just completely like, just blew me away. The, the whole, the monumentality of the composition, the beauty of the modeling. It's also a painting that's very damaged and, this, and you can see the crack in the middle of the picture running here. And it, there's something that in that damage, you can also see the underdrawing in the, 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 um, the mantle of the Magdalene. So there's this, uh, it's, a paint, it's something that it's an object that's gone through a lot and it really somewhat matches the, the drama of uh, what it depicts, the Pieta. So the, it, was, it, it was just this kind of seminal encounter. And uh, I subsequently, uh, decided to uh, do my PhD on, on that period and I worked on Carton and so it kind of really you know informed the rest of my academic career and um, that very day actually when I saw this painting for the first time I then walked down Rue de Rivoli and went to Galignani which is this wonderful bookshop in Paris and opened the book and it fell on uh, this uh, other work by Carton called The Coronation of the Virgin, which, I, which is this one, very different in nature, but I realized, you know, it was by the same man. And I was like, you know, who, who made this? The two in a day, first of all, it was quite miraculous. Uh, and uh, yeah, it just really convinced me that I really wanted to work on this material. Uh, the contrast also between the two and the, 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 the colors and, um, yeah, I was just completely, you know, I, it was love at first sight. <laughs> I remember, I remember being in Avignon with you looking at this. Yeah. Just, I mean, it's just an unbelievable work of art. It's just yeah. so fantastic. I mean, both of them are, but and yeah. he, he's a great, great artist. But this is just, I mean, and this also is a very big painting. And it's just so, when, when you encounter it, it's just such a sort of incredible surprise. Yeah, it's completely striking. It really works from, it works for both a distance actually and quite up close because it's really wonderful in details, but it has this, it's a really, really wonderful uh, object. And also, I mean, in this case, I spent, it's a number, it's chapter three of my PhD. So I spent an unreasonable amount of time thinking about this and I still find it wonderful, which I think really speaks to, you know, how good it is because he's not an artist for which of which I find you you get tired of actually and I think that's the uh, a, a characteristic of really great ones is that you don't you know however however much time you spend on them it, they, it keeps its appeal 
And I think, you know, we can't answer with the same answer for different questions, but he's also one of the great underestimated artists of, of the Western. Yeah, I almost, yeah, I almost, you know, I, it was very much on my list. Uh, and also, you know, and I mean, the French galleries at the Louvre anyway, I really urge people to go. They're always empty and they, there's really quite some treasures there. But he is indeed a very underestimated artist. I was comforted to see, though, a few years ago, an article about the 10 paintings that the curators of the Louvre would save in case, you know, there was a fire or something. And the Pieta was among them. So wow. I, felt, I felt validated in my choice. That's a great masterpiece of French painting. Yeah. For sure. And very few of them survive as well. It's also due to accidents of survival that we don't know more about them because so, so few. So in that sense, it's, also, it's even more of a rarity and even more precious. So I always dreamed of leave, living in the charter house of Villeneuve Les Avignon and I think that would be a quite quite a good place to live in uh, yeah. but if if you could pick a work of art to live in besides staying there and, and living with this wonderful coronation what what would you live with so I actually went for uh, a book a manuscript uh, which has also which you know also goes back to my graduate studies uh, the first time I visited Chantilly uh, just outside Paris uh, there are kept 40 leaves that once belonged to a book of hours commissioned by the French treasure Etienne Chevalier. So the, the, the work of art I would choose is called The Hours of Etienne Chevalier. And here we see the um, opening of uh, the matins uh, for the hours of the Virgin. Uh, and it's this beautiful diptych with uh, Etienne Chevalier and treated by St. Stephen to the Virgin and Child. But what's wonderful is that, you know, they're no bigger than contemporary postcards. There's 40 of them in Chantilly. I would like to reunite them. So I'm cheating a bit because it's like, I would like to reunite them as a book with the seven others that are spread in collections across the world. And, um, and also I would like to speculate on the other wonderful miniatures that adorn these books that are now lost. Uh, uh, and for me, the idea of a book and especially a book of hours would be this amazing encounter with a very intimate objects and the performance of, you know, turning the pages and this every time you're surprised and you discover this like amazing uh, imageries and, and Fouquet is this really remarkable, you know, he's so good on small scale. I mean, he's good, he's a really good panel painter as well, but he really, in this work, really, you know, excels as nowhere else. Um, they're so inventive, they're full of amazing details. The, you can't really see also in reproductions, but the, the treatment of the gold highlights in every single of these leaves is, uh, is just such a, it's such a joy. Uh, the preciousness of it. It's, uh, yeah, so I would love to just, you know, every day relish in turning the pages of my book and every day see new details because it's really the type of images, the more you look at, the more they give you. So, you know, it really rewards close and sustained looking. And I really, I really like that about images of the period. So, yeah, I think I, I would be happy to live with that. <laughs> I always love the idea of, of people across the centuries having these books of hours and using them and leafing through yeah. them. And it's, it's just, I mean, it's such a personal thing. And I think also the encounter with these leaves, that I, the ones at Chantilly especially, it's such a personal encounter. You're there in the small room and they're, you know, all together in a room. And it's, it just looks so fantastic. It's, it's, it's actually one of my favorite things at Chantilly as well. I love it. <laughs> I, I always make the pilgrimage for, for that specifically. And Chancy has so many other treasures. And actually in this room, there's like two Raphael that I never looked at. <laughs> you know, just, um, but also the idea of, you know, the weight of a book that, of, of this kind that you have in your hands. It's, it's something so, so wonderful. And in this case, it's quite dramatic what happened to them in the sense that they were indeed cut out, dismantled, etc. But it gives us the privilege to see them all at once at Chantilly. And I really recommend this experience to, uh, to everyone. Yeah. So since we're talking about books, now yes. something not quite as beautifully illuminated as this, but what is the book you keep going back to that inspires you over and over again? So that would have to be Baudelaire's uh, Petit Poèmes en Prose, Le Spin de Paris. Uh, it's a book I first picked up when I was probably 15, 16, uh, really, really bored uh, in, a, in the countryside with my grandparents. And it was like, I think they were, everyone was napping, there was nothing to do. And I don't know how I found it, but it fell in my lap and I started reading it and I read it in an afternoon. It was very short and it blew my mind. It's insane. And in terms, it's, it's 
they are they're they're called poems, but they're really like more like vignettes or little stories, short stories almost. One page, two pages, sometimes a bit more. And each of them with very few, you know, very few space and very few words, it evoke an entire world. I mean, it's completely insane. And they are, they, they talk about uh, love, about sex, about politics, about um, modernity, about, you know, Paris at the time, high and low. And it's completely mesmerizing. The language is, in French is, you know, absolutely remarkable. And something that I think no one gives Baudelaire enough credit for is that they're actually hilarious. They're really funny. He's really, really like, he's really funny. He makes fun of, he's very disrespectful. He makes fun of everything. He's not always where you expect him to be. Um, so yeah, I mean, they're, they're, the imagery is profoundly vivid. And I go back to it, and I didn't go up to it for a bit because I was afraid that it would be a bit of a teenager thing, you know, the Baudelaire thing, especially in France. So for a few years, I didn't go back to it. And I think when I was 25, I did finally pick it up again. And, um, and it just blew my mind again. And now I return to it every year. And, there's every, and every year it's different. Sometimes I see more the political aspect of it. Sometimes I see more you know, his treatment of women, or uh, it's really, it's really, it's really quite wonderful how actually polymorphous it, a work it is and how it grows up with you somehow. And do you think that as a Parisian yourself, someone who grew up there, uh, this has a different effect on you? I mean, do you recognize the city you grew up in or, or do you think it's, it has also universal themes in there that go beyond Paris? I think it does go beyond Paris. The Paris of Baudelaire is, I mean, let's say that today's Paris is not nearly as um, cool as Baudelaire's Paris. <laughs> it's much, uh, and you know, it was a city in flux. It was a much more dangerous city. It was a much less diverse city. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's more about change and modernity and like the, the turmoil of that. And I think these are universal themes actually. And uh, you know, a lot of them are also about love. There's a lot about social class distinction, which I think speaks to, you know, um, inequalities today. There's a lot about gender dynamics. There's a lot about um, people who are trying too hard to be cool. There's, there's so much. There's, uh, so I think, no, I don't think, I think it really didn't age too much because you could think that because it was so anchored in that moment, it would um, lose its relevance, but I don't think it did, no. <laughs> And so we now move to music. And I think for music, you've chosen something very different, very far away from Paris. So what, what is your music? So this is a, an album that Philip Glass recorded with a Brazilian band called Wakti. And that uh, each of the songs in the recording is uh, about um, a river that goes into the Amazon. Uh, so it's called, my favorite one, so the, the album is called Aguas de Amazonia. And the, uh, my favorite song in it is called um, Jacfora River. And I, it's, a, it's a song that I, I mean, it's a piece of music I listened to all the time when I was, especially when I was writing my PhD when I was writing the Van catalog and it just kind of stayed with me and um, it's quite entrancing and mysterious and and a bit psychedelic and while I was writing about all these monks and mystics and all these you know very spiritual people which I'm not really I, I, I it's kind of put me in the right set of mind and I just think it's really beautiful and I really like you know, I really like Philip Glass. I think he's a wonderful composer. So he's amazing. Uh, yeah. And yeah. And, you know, and it's also a very New York choice. And that sense, it's like New York mid Brazil, which like does appropriate. Yeah. So, so you're one of those people like me, I, I take it, who listens to music while writing. Yeah. I, yeah. You know, so many people cannot do that. They need pure silence to write. Yeah. But I actually, I find that I cannot write in silence. I need music. And I, yeah. and I will often need music I like and music I know. It can't be a new piece of music because others I'm following the music. But. It's distracting otherwise. And this one is interesting because it's, um, so there's a bit of, it's a bit figurative, right? The, the idea of the river. So there's a flow and like it goes, at some point it goes faster and then it slows down again. And I thought that was interesting to think about the flow of a river and the flow of writing and how it mirrors that somehow. And that was, there was a bit of that when I was, when I was writing to this. So yeah, no, it's a really good song. I love the idea of you you writing about Van Eyck and charter houses and, and Carthusian monks while listening to Brazilian. Yeah. 
<laughs> rivers. It's, it's, it's a wonderful combination. It worked. <laughs> it did. So, um, most overrated artist. Overrated. Okay. Um, it might be a bit of a low blow, but I think René Magritte is really not that great. Uh, for two reasons, so I'll, I'll have a two-step argument. Well, first of all, in terms of in terms of contents, I think some of his, you know, sometimes it's quite poetic. It can be quite funny, but or you know, but sometimes it's just a bit of a one-liner. It's just you know, taking something, displacing it, and then that's that's kind of it. It's a bit, it's a bit the the kind of um, mechanism you find in ads also I don't know so I just thought it was kind of intellectually a bit vacuous and then I also have a real problem about the way he paints I think he's a terrible painter I think he does he's not really good with brushes I have to say this example at MoMA is, is I think a good one I mean it's really not that great and maybe in this case he's trying to do something a bit naive but I, I, I don't buy it if you look at he's especially bad at painting drapery which is something I really take issue with. Even his two lovers who kiss each other uh, with bags on their head uh, are just the, 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 the drapery work is, is really just not that great. And yeah, no, I just don't, I think he, he's just not, I think they're poorly painted wine liners. That's what I think. Yeah, about. and it's not even, you know, I think the naive aspect of them, which could be charming, you know, if you think of other artists like Duane yeah. Rousseau, yeah. He's so charming and so full of like life and, and, and excitement. And well, I, I agree with you. I always think Magritte is a bit of a sort of one, you know, the one punchline and, and yeah. just doesn't leave very much. And I mean, yeah. it can be witty at times, but yeah. I, I, yeah, it doesn't go much beyond that. Um, exactly. This painting always also puzzled me. I just, I have no idea what this painting really is about. And it's just, I, it, it's an upsetting picture. You know, I don't know what it's about, and I don't, I'm not sure I want to know what it's about. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to inquire. And I mean, yeah, I just, um, I think the difference with Duane Busso is interesting because uh, with Magritte, there is a pretension to actually paint in an old masterly tradition. He places himself there. So there is this kind of claim that he makes, and then he can't really follow up with, uh, wow. kind of, he can't back it up uh, with actual. Uh, technical mastery. So um, I'm, yeah, I'm not really uh, convinced by, by his work. So underrated, we're not going for carton, but you've chosen no. something pretty powerful. Well, I, so I just wanted to prove, you know, that I don't, I don't hate Belgium. So I, should, I went for another Northern artist. Uh, in this case, Peter Ball Rubens, because obviously he's one of the greatest names in our history and it's, he's not really an, an outlier here. But I thought that, um, I think he's, everyone is always like, oh yeah, Rubens boring. Uh, he's unfashionable at the moment, let's put it this way. His big fleshy women tend to um, not really please the public uh, anymore. And I just wanted to uh, point out how actually, I think he's one of the greatest painters that ever were in terms of his manipulation of paint uh, and in terms of the intelligence within wh with which he 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 builds up a narrative he takes uh, figures from the antique and then reassembles them and like put them in his compositions and you don't see it you know you, you you don't even see it it really takes a while to disentangle the web of references he's making because he's appropriating them so intelligently and he's also a master he's such a master of color and and of light and yeah i think he's one of the greatest you know artist of his day, undoubtedly. And I think we should look at him twice because it's, it's, it's a bit easy to dismiss because of the, the type of bodies that he represented just don't suit contemporary fashion. And I think if you look close at a Rubens and you look at the way his brushwork is so sensual when things are in good condition and there's too, not too much workshop intervention, which also dug into his reception. Um, so yeah, I don't know what you think, Xavier, in terms of. And I, oh, I, I agree. I mean, I think he's an amazing painter, and you know, gosh, he can paint draperies. Yeah. I mean, that's you know, um, but yeah, I think you know, he. I, I agree with you. He's um, maybe it's the subject matters, you know, the religious subject matters, the mythological. You know, people don't relate to those. I'm always very surprised that people, um, you know, relate to other 17th century artists today in much more direct ways, but somehow Rubens never makes it there but you know he is one of the great great painters of, of yeah. the time. 
And here we've decided to show a, a highly finished painting, but his uh, sketches are, you know, where he's really just thinking on the page with like a load of brush is, is really quite, are really also completely wonderful. And he's an amazing draftsman as well. Yeah. So. It's, it's funny when you think that in the 17th century, you know, three of the greatest painters who ever lived really lived in the 17th century. So it's sort of Rubens, Velasquez and, and Rembrandt. Yeah. And the fact that these three people are exact contemporaries, more or less, yeah. And, and, you know, they, what they do with paint in very different ways. I mean, the three of them are, are almost diametrically opposed from one another. Um, but it is, it is really unsurpassed in a, number, in a number of ways, I think. To just know how it's gonna, how paint's going to behave and how to evoke a range of uh, effects and textures with just, you know, one, one dash. Mm -hmm. and, and you can really tell the difference when it's, um, it's a follower who does it because it becomes perfunctory. It becomes mechanical, whereas Absolutely. with them it's always just so, yeah, so wonderful and sensual and, and just clever. You can see the intelligence of the artist coming through, I think, as, as well as his technical abilities. Absolutely, absolutely. So our last question, you know, and when I, when, when I think of you, I can always imagine you as being portrayed by, you know, Van der Weyden or maybe <laughs> even Fouquet or, you know, one of these wonderful sort of polished northern artists. <laughs> But you've actually surprised me with your choice. So who would portray you? <laughs> so I went south. Uh, I yeah. went to Italy with Bronzino uh, because, um, yeah, because they're a bit stern, the northerners, for that. So I wanted something with a bit more, you know, pizzazz. So, yeah, Bronzino, uh, you know, we, I always, I'm, I'm quite warm and, uh, and, lively so I always wanted to be deep frozen by Bronzino I thought he would like give me a sense of uh, the decorum I might lack uh, and so yeah I think he's as good as it gets for that um, he imbues his portraits with uh, with extreme refinement and uh, sophistication and actually so here we have obviously the portrait of a woman and a man, but I also wanted um, to put the portrait of a man because I think he, he's even better at depicting men and I think the poses are obviously due to the conventions of the day but the poses can could be a bit more uh, extravagant and, and exciting so I'd like to be portrayed uh, as, as, as in a pose that would be more befitting to a man if I was portrayed by Bronzino. I also I thought as a French person, I need, you know, I, I love my fashion, so I needed someone who knows how to paint clothes. And uh, Bronzino certainly does pay a lot of attention to that. So I would like a great dress and a, a good pause and a very kind of uh, wonderfully uh, frozen attitude. <laughs> In many ways, Bronzino, I mean, you know, he's a quintessentially Italian artist, but there is something Northern about him. I think this, this coolness, this attention to detail also this, you know, if you think of other 16th century painters, you know, think of, I mean, Titian is so different, of course, um, but the way he, he paints every leaf of the, of the book in the, in the Met portrait on the right, yeah. or the, the way he depicts the fabric, the different types of fabric in the Panchatiki portrait on the left, it's, it's really unbelievable. And that, I, I always think of Van Eyck or Van der Weyden or, or those sort of artists. I mean, not that there is a, a direct obvious link, but it kind of always reminds me of that sort of thing. Holbein as well. I mean, there's a lot of Holbein in, in Bronzino. There's a northern meticulousness and attention to detail that I think comes through. There's a lack of painterliness, actually. It's the anti rubens actually. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> but Absolutely. Um, I, I, think he's, uh, I think he's just very chic. That is for sure. And I think it's a very, very good choice. Well, thank you so much, Emma, for joining us today. Hope all is well in London. And yeah, yeah, we'll see you soon. Yeah, cheers. Bye. Bye-bye.